This is the second video for the instructional method called System Elise Prompts. In this video, we will continue our discussion about coaching parents using evidence-based practices. However, this video is especially appropriate for educators and different practitioners who want to become more systematic with their instruction. As we said in our introductory video, System Elise Prompts is an evidence-based strategy that has been successfully used in classrooms and taught to parents to use in their homes. System Elise Prompts is also known as least to most prompting or increasing assistance prompting, and it is one of the more commonly used hierarchical strategies within the response prompting repertoire because it is more flexible and easy to use than some of the other methods. This teaching method um, is considered to be evidence-based for teaching change behaviors and for learners who are 13 years old or above. This concludes the summation of the introductory video. So if you would like to know more information about the demographics of students that this method is evidence-based for, please go back and review the introductory video if you haven't had time to do so. System release prompts is considered a self-fading procedure, meaning that how intrusive you are when you're implementing the prompt lessens as the learner learns to perform the behavior independently. And because the self-fading is built into the method at each step, this can possibly prevent the issue of learners developing prompt dependency. And this is because once the learner is able to perform the skills by themselves, they will most likely perform it at a lesser prompt level so that they can receive their reinforcement sooner. With this teaching procedure, if the learner does not correctly respond to the target stimulus, or the stimulus that was targeted by the instructor that will cue the student or the learner that it's time to respond, then they will follow up by doing one of two things. They will implement a more intrusive prompt or they will implement a more controlling prompt. And the prompt level that they select depends on where they are with implementing the prompting hierarchy. And we're about to go into that a little bit more in depth. But I just want to make clear that the target stimulus is the stimulus that the instructor thought through as a target that will cause the student to engage in the behavior that they're learning. Picking the target stimulus is one of the most important parts of the method because it is always the first option with each step when we're doing the hierarchy. But then also we want to pick stimuluses that are naturally occurring in the environment because that will eventually control the behavior without any prompts. The goal is for that target stimulus to cause the student to engage in the behavior and, and that will be the end of it. There will be no need for prompts. So we're going to pick things that are naturally occurring or that could be easily supported in the environment. So for example, in school, um, we could use a bell that signals class changes, or the students could use a calendar system um, or a schedule system, and that will allow them to know that, okay, at this time, it's time for me to line up to go to class, another class, or it's time for me to line up to go to lunch. And that is them performing the skill independently. So the first step that we're going to think through is what in my environment will naturally cue the student to perform this behavior? And is this something that can always be available to them or easily made available to them? As a caregiver, you would think through the same process. So when you're thinking through your target stimulus in your home, you could think what stimulus can I target that will eventually cue my child to engage in, for example, um, 
um, getting ready to take a bath or getting ready to go to bed or getting ready to go to school. Um, and it can be something that is constructed or brought into the home if it fits into your belief system or your culture. Some people um, are using visual schedules and it has icons or pictures of meal time or bath time or time to brush my teeth or time to do my homework, free time. All of those things can be implemented easily as a visual schedule in the home. And that will eventually cue your child that it's time to do those behaviors. If you are a caregiver who is looking to gain access to some visual prompting systems or visual schedules, a great resource is teacherspayteachers.com and you would type in visual schedules in the search and they have a lot of um, beautifully made professional looking schedules that you can purchase for a couple of dollars or you could ask your classroom teacher to um, make schedules for you and then that way you could work as a team to make it seamless that the student is using the schedule at school and then they're coming home and they're using a similar schedule at home. Okay, so the next step when designing instruction using system release prompts, the parent or the instructor needs to establish what prompting hierarchy they want to use. With this method, you need a minimum of three prompt levels, and one of those levels must be the independent level that we discussed called the target stimulus. And in this, again, the student or the child has the opportunity to respond alone with no prompts. Then a minimum of two additional prompts must be added, and you can have more than two prompts based on the need of the learner. So for example, um, the learner is given the opportunity to um, wash their hands independently each step in that chain before a prompt is provided from the hierarchy. And this allows the student to kind of self-select what prompt they need by waiting to receive the guidance um, because they know they will be successful for each step of the chain with the prompts as they gain experience with the instructor. Now we are about to talk about the type of prompts that you can select in your hierarchy for system of these prompts. Before we talk about it further, let's watch a brief video so that you can actually see what the prompts look like. So guys, we're going to talk about prompting right now, and uh, prompting are basically uh, clues that would help the student be able to answer what's being asked of them. Um, we want to make sure that we're always errorlessly teaching, and that means that the student is able to perform the task with the help of an instructor or a teacher. So we're going to get started with a hand over hand prompt, and essentially a hand over hand prompt means that you're doing the full action for the student. So if we're going to ask Priya to put the circle in, I'm going to do that right now, put circle in. So I'm going to take her hand and I'm going to place it into the circle. Um, hand over hand prompts are mostly used for students who are just learning the skill and they're very new to the skill. So we want to make sure that we're helping them every step of the way. Now we're going to talk about partial prompt, and partial prompt is a bit different from hand over hand. Uh, we're going to let go of uh, the student's hand at the very last second so that they can see where the shape goes. So Priya, let's put circle in. I'm going to hold her hand, and while she's going to the, the circle, I'm going to let go, and she's going to put it in by herself. But basically, I got her to the circle, and then she did the rest of the work. Now we're going to talk about a different type of partial prompt. This is where we're going to help Priya in a different way, and I'm going to hold her arm in a different location. So Priya, we're going to put circle in. I'm going to hold her elbow, 
And we're going to do the same thing. When we get to the circle, I'm going to let go, and then she's going to do the rest of the work. Another variation to that is now we're going to do a triangle. And instead of holding the elbow, I'm going to hold the shoulder. This is for people who are a bit more confident with the skill, and they can be very successful at it. We want to make sure, again, that we're aerolessly teaching. So I can help Priya by just holding up here. We're going to go slightly up, and again, she's doing most of the work. And there we go. The next prompt level we're going to do is a gestural prompt. And in this prompt, we're not going to make any physical contact with Priya whatsoever. So all I'm going to do is ask Priya to put the triangle in. Priya, put triangle in. And all I'm doing is I'm pointing to the shape of where it should be going. And that's about it for gestural prompt. The next prompt we're going to talk about is positional prompt. And with positional prompt, again, we're not going to physically interact with the child. We're going to make sure that the stimuli is going to be positioned in a certain way. So for this, if Priya is identifying the triangle, we're going to put the triangle closer to Priya. So we're going to say, Priya, show me the triangle. And right here, we have the circle very far away and the triangle very close to her. So again, we're going to ask Priya, show us the triangle. And because it's so close to her, she's going to be more inclined to go for the shape that's closer to her. So the next prompt we're going to do is a visual prompt. And with this, you can see a picture of a triangle. And I'm going to ask Priya to give us the triangle, but making sure that I show her the picture just before I do that. So it's a visual reference before she can pick out the triangle. So Priya, show us the triangle and she would choose the triangle. The reason why we're pairing uh, the visual with what I'm saying is because sometimes kids with autism have a hard time understanding what we're saying, but if we provide the visual as well, it makes the statement a bit clearer. The next type of prompt we're gonna talk about is a verbal prompt, and sometimes in ABA it's called an interverbal. Interverbal means that we would start the first sound of the word and then Priya would finish it. But for now, we're going to assume that Priya doesn't know what a triangle is, so I'm going to give her the full verbal prompt. So Priya, what is this called? Triangle. Triangle. What is this called? Tri... Triangle. Perfect. The second part of our verbal prompt is that I'm going to say the first part of the word and we're hoping after much exposure to the word triangle, that Priya would understand once I say try, she will say angle. So Priya, what is this called? Try? Triangle. Priya, what is this called? Try? Triangle. Perfect. That was such a great video because it clearly demonstrated the wide variety of prompts that you can select when designing instruction using System Elise prompts. The prompts are categorized based on how much assistance it provides to the learner. So within System Elise prompts, there are two types of prompts that are used, and they are called controlling and non-controlling prompt. A controlling prompt ensures that the learner will perform the step correctly. So in the video, we saw that he used a physical prompt where he placed his hand over her hand to make sure that she performed the step correctly. A non-controlling prompt only increases the possibility that the student will perform the step correctly. However, it doesn't ensure that they will perform the step correctly. And there's one very important factor that we have to keep in mind that a controlling prompt for one learner may not be a controlling prompt for another learner. Another consideration that we need to take into account is that some children or adults do not like to be touched. So if a learner has a tactile defense, then you would not use a hand over hand. You would select another prompt. And in that case, you would do your best to try to block the, the learner from making an error, but sometimes it's not possible to do that. But I'm just saying that to demonstrate that all of this is individualized and it's very fluid and um, user friendly for parents to use in their home and also for other practitioners to use to 
implement strategies or lessons more systematically. 